Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today, my special guest is New York Times bestselling author Nabil Qureshi, and we're talking about his brand new book, Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward, which is published by our good friends over at Zondervan. Nabil, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, you grew up in a loving American Muslim home. Uh, a lot of times people don't equate those things together. So would love to just hear a bit about what was that experience like for you? Yeah, Islam, as I knew it, was a religion that taught me to seek God, to seek his pleasure, uh, taught me discipline to pray multiple times a day, to memorize scripture, to be loving towards my family, towards others. So Islam, as I knew it, was a religion of peace. And so when I told people that, I meant it. I wasn't lying. That was my experience of Islam, something that I think many Christians could relate to if they want to give it the effort of connecting with their Muslim neighbors. Now, one of the things that you bring out early in answering jihad is that you had a bit of an internal struggle as to whether or not you should write this book. And really, until recently, you hadn't quite made that decision. Tell us what changed. How did you come to the decision point where you knew it was the right time to write this book? Actually, within the past year, I remember recall telling my publisher that I just would not write a book on jihad. It's too polemical an issue. It's too divisive, too charged. The problem was After the Paris attacks, right before Thanksgiving, and then San Bernardino right after Thanksgiving, I was waiting for someone to say what I thought needed to be said. I was waiting for someone to speak that voice of truth, that we ought to discuss Islam as an entity distinct from Muslims, and to approach the two very carefully, not to conflate them. But no one was saying that. And so... The Wheaton controversy plus the political stances were just magnifying the confusion. And I felt the Lord leading me to write a response to the current climate. And that's what this book is about. It's a response to the polarity that I see within the current social climate. I want to take a quick departure to kind of a practical matter. Obviously, it's an understatement to say that Answering Jihad is a timely book. But I work in the Christian publishing industry, and and reading in your acknowledgments, you talk about moving from concept to execution in in less than three weeks. And the time frame in which this book was published is really almost unheard of in the space we work in. I would just be curious to get a little feedback. For you, what was that like as an author? Obviously, that's different from some of your previous writing experiences. Like I said, really felt this answer needed to come out quickly. And so what I was going to do was just write a series of blogs. And then I realized that, well, at least I don't read that many blogs, so I assume nobody else does. So I just figured, well, why not make it an ebook? And when I was talking to a friend about that, he said, well, just ask Zondervan when they could publish this. And uh, this was just before Christmas Day that the idea occurred to me. And so I talked to them. And again, it was Christmas break, and yet they were very responsive. And they said we could have it in stores at the beginning of March. And so I felt that if I wanted to get into more hands, if I wanted the message to get out, that I needed to go that route. So the Lord really provided. The book was written in just under two weeks. And like I said, it is a response. I want people to realize that it's a primer on jihad. It's not the deepest treatment you'll read, but it is accessible and it's related to this time. And, and that's why I wrote it. And I think the Lord, hopefully, I'm praying, he'll use it for that purpose. Well, hats off to the Zondervan team. That is an impressive timeline. Way to go. Uh, <laughs> now, in the news media, one of the things we keep hearing is the phrase, Islam is a religion of peace. Why are we seeing that everywhere online and in the media? Why do they keep pushing that concept? Because they're afraid that people will start retaliating against Muslims, that they'll do exactly what I was just saying, is they'll conflate the violent Muslims with the peaceful Muslims, and they'll retaliate against everyone. So I think the compassion that drives the statement, Islam is a religion of peace, is noble. The problem is it's often ungrounded, right? Why should we be compassionate towards other people, especially if they're trying to kill us? That's why I think the gospel message is very important. Even in the face of people who are trying to kill you, we have good reason to love them. But that said, not all Muslims are trying to kill us. In fact, a very small number are. And so we can approach this issue carefully if we start disentangling the rhetoric for one. So to just say Islam is a religion of peace without qualifying that in any way, is very problematic. In what sense is Islam a religion of peace? If you look at the life of Muhammad, the very moment he could fight, as soon as he was able to get a fighting force, he did fight, and he fought until he died. 
launching an average of over nine battles a year. And it was shortly after his death that Muslims conquered one third of the known world and ever since then have been waging battles and wars. Christians responded with the Crusades at the end of the 11th century, but that was only after two thirds of the Christian world had been conquered by Muslims. And so, what do we mean when we say Islam is a religion of peace? If we're trying to say that it is somehow distinct in its foundations or in its history from violence, that's just factually incorrect. Also in the book, you define jihad as a struggle. If we're not familiar with that, how are we supposed to understand that? What are they struggling against? Yeah, good question. So when we're talking about the word jihad, we're talking about the Arabic word that's translated as struggle. But in the context of the Quran and early Islam, it was always understood to be a struggle for religious purposes. So for the sake of Islam and how that played out in the records was usually a violent battle with other people. So sometimes there was an internal struggle that was envisioned. You struggle against your will. But generally speaking, that was not the case. It was envisioned as a violent struggle with other people, usually leading to death. We have to understand the evolving notion of jihad. The Quran was not a book that was composed in one sitting. I'm not saying Mark or Matthew was either. But the Quran was composed over 23 years, which is not like uh, any of the books of the Bible. And parts were added and taken out, and words evolved in that period of time. And then the canonical texts of Islam include the traditions of Muhammad. So Islam is not a sola scriptura faith, as is Protestant Christianity. The Quran is interpreted in the light of Islamic traditions, and those were formulated over about two and a half to three centuries after Muhammad's death, and the concept of jihad evolves throughout that time, so that by the time it's finally canonized into a system, jihad, it has rules of how you engage in jihad. I was talking to a Nigerian friend the other day. He was telling me that before neighborhoods are attacked, Christian neighborhoods in his home uh, area of Jos. Muslims would send out pamphlets, and he never knew why. They would say that we will attack in the next few weeks. The reason why is because jihad, when it was finally codified, had rules. And one of those rules is you have to warn people before you attack them. So this all happened in the centuries following Islam. But the word jihad, struggle, is grounded as a violent struggle, even in Muhammad's life in the traditions of Islam. Earlier you made reference to Wheaton College, and if you have been paying attention to the news, clearly they've been in the headlines bringing to the forefront of everybody's mind, you know, do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? When people talk to you about that, how do you answer that question? I have a chapter of that in my book, Answering Jihad. I also did a debate with Miroslav Wolf, who's probably one of the most outspoken proponents within Christendom that Muslims and Christians do worship the same God. So you can access that debate online. Long story short, The Islamic God is in many ways very different from the Christian God. He's not unconditionally loving, and that comes from the fact that he's not triune. He denies being a father. He denies being a son. He denies us being his beloved children, chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. He's a God that's okay with polygamy. In fact, he allows for it in the Quran, whereas Jesus tells us that from the beginning, man and women were supposed to be one flesh. So, very different in a variety of important ways. But the one thing that I point out to people who tend to argue this from a more academic standpoint is that Islam specifically rejects the Christian notion of God. It rejects being a father and a son because Christianity asserts it. It rejects the Trinity because Christianity asserts it. It's unlike any other worldview, at least any other major worldview in that sense. And so uh, I don't think that we can argue that Muslims and Christians are worshiping the same God given that explicit rejection. One last thing. Islam sets up as its central doctrine. Uh, the, the central doctrine of Christianity is, is love, I would say. The central doctrine of Islam is Tawheed, that God is one, that he is not one as in the Shema, but one as in absolutely monadic, that he is not a trinity. So not only do you have a rejection of the trinity in Islam, that is the central doctrine of Islam. Well, I wonder too, if the challenge for people is it's that, that same kind of fear, the fear that makes them want to say that Islam is a religion of peace, that you know they don't want to offend, they don't want to show our differences. Have you seen that in your experience? Absolutely. I mean, compassion is what's driving a lot of Christians to build these bridges with Muslims. And so I don't condemn Christians who do say Muslims and Christians worship the same God. I think they're wrong, but I don't condemn them. I see where they're coming from. I can see why they think what they think. And I see the missiological advantage of it. That said, there is a great disadvantage as well. 
when you say to a Muslim that Jesus is God, they don't get it because they're envisioning Allah. When you start talking about a God such as the God of the Old Testament, who enters into this world and walked with Adam in the garden, who wrestled with Jacob, who dined with Moses and the elders, who dwelt in glory in the tabernacle, once you start envisioning a God who enters into this world, who is pluriform, as we see Abraham in Genesis 19.24, he encounters a God who's right there on the earth and a God who's in heaven at the same time. Yahweh is in two places at once. You see in Daniel 7, Yahweh being in two places at once. The same thing in Psalm 110, verse 1. When you start seeing that the Christian God is different from the Islamic God, that's when Muslims will start understanding the gospel. So that's why I say, look, we need to be theologically very correct here. But that said, I appreciate the compassion that those Christians have who are reaching out to Muslims, and I would encourage more of that compassion. But it needs to be held in tension with the truth, which is where I'm coming from in this book, Answering Jihad. Compassion with Truth. That's what I mean by the subtitle of Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward. That's helpful. Thank you for that. Now, we're in a presidential election year. All the Oval Office hopefuls are weighing in on terrorism, jihad, and immigration issues. What are the political candidates getting wrong as they engage in this discussion? That's a, that's a tricky question to answer. There's so much that's being conflated. So much has to because of sound bites and the way the media represents things. So I feel bad for a lot of our politicians because anytime you're in the news, you're going to be misrepresented. That said, I do think that we ought to be very careful. Some of these politicians have conflated Muslims with Islam. And because Islam is dangerous, they're suggesting that we treat all Muslims as potential threats. I think we need to be much more careful than to proceed down that road. We did that with the Japanese in World War II, and we regret it to this day. So let's not do that. At the same time, let's not do as Tony Blair has done, as David Cameron, as Francois Holland and Barack Obama and George Bush all did, which is to say that because we ought to have compassion for Muslims, that we should deny the reality of violent jihad. No, let's not do that, because if we deny the reality of violent jihad, more San Bernardinos will happen, more Fort Hoods will happen. Fort Hood was certainly a terrorist attack, and we're denying it. That's very problematic. So I'm hoping answering jihad ends up in the hands of some of these diplomats. Who knows if it does? But we need to disentangle the entities of Islam and Muslims, see them individually as what they are, not conflate the two, in order to move forward much more clearly. I'm not a policy expert. I don't know what to do about refugees. Should we keep them out? Well, there's an advantage of that, which would be to keep our own people safe. At the same time, though, shouldn't we as Christians welcome people in so that they can be freed from their persecution, not fearing for our own lives because we've not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control? I don't know necessarily how to broach these specific policy issues, but I do know how we should be thinking about them individually. Let's not be worried about our own lives, as Christians anyway. We're not called to worry about our own lives. We're called to worry about those around us and love them, and that includes the refugees and the Americans who are already here. That, I think, would be a better starting point on how to move forward. Nabil, as readers wrap up reading the book, if they could only take one call to action or, or some way that they're doing something differently, What would you like that to be? It would be that we want to see this world changed. We want to see it free from jihad. But how is that going to happen if we sequester ourselves from the Muslims who are radicalizing people? There's a battle going on for the hearts of Muslims who are not radicalized yet and for the hearts of people who are on the verge of converting to Islam. And in order to win this battle, now I'm talking about not a battle of flesh and blood, but a spiritual battle, we need to engage We need to reach out to those people who are on the cusp of becoming radicalized. I think Muslims are approaching a threefold fork in the road. I approached this threefold fork in the road. When I was a Muslim, I realized that Islam was inherently violent. My whole life, I grew up thinking Islam wasn't. I thought it was a religion of peace. But when I studied the sources, I realized, no, indeed, this is a violent faith. Violence is large across its pages, even in its foundations. Once they come to that realization, They will have one of three directions to go. They will either become nominal, they'll become apostates, or they'll become radicalized. And if we leave them to make that decision on their own, there's a much greater chance that they'll become radicalized. They're not going to look at the sources of Islam and just stay where they are. Either they'll leave Islam, or they'll become nominal and not want anything to do with any religion, or they'll become radicalized. Let's engage them at that moment, like my friend David did with me, sharing with me another option the love of Jesus. If we do that, I think we'll not only preclude 
radicalization, but will also fill the heavenly ranks with warriors for the gospel. And I think there's such an opportunity to do that right now. That's my prayer for people who encounter my book. And Nabil, if the listeners want to connect with you and find out more about Answering Jihad, where's the best place for them to do that on the web? AnsweringJihad.com will take you to the website we've set up. I also work with a ministry called Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, a group of people who are excellent thinkers and passionate for reaching people with the gospel. So check out rzim.org or answeringjihad.com. Either one should work. All right, and it's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation today with Nabil Qureshi. Once again, our book today was Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward. For more on Nabil and this new book, head on over to answeringjihad.com. You can also find out more at the publisher's website, which is available at zondervan.com. Nabil, just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate it. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Thank you.